Speaker Barroso. Still on the same theme, sort of. Just dancing around it slightly differently. Nice to have you. I'd actually come with a um, slide presentation, but uh, now that I'm a little familiar with the format, I'm not going to use my presentation, so the AV guy shouldn't panic if I don't press the button. Uh, I'm going to start with the story. In 1839, a Welsh judge, a lawyer, not a scientist, decided that he was going to try an experiment which was going to reverse the process of electrolysis. And those of you still remember your um, grade 11 chemistry, and Vasta would be happy if you still do, is um, if you take a beaker of water, you put two pieces of wire in it, you pass electricity through it, and you heard a pop. What you were doing was you were breaking the water down into its constituent parts, hydrogen and oxygen. So this particular judge in Wales, by the name of William Grove, Sir William Grove, decided if he could reverse that process, if he could start with hydrogen and oxygen and combine it somehow, maybe he could make electricity and water. And so about 160 years ago, he was successful in demonstrating that. That was the first time electricity was made uh, through this process. And it was the invention of a device called the fuel cell. Now, unlike a battery, which stores electricity that is made somewhere else, you charge your battery, and then you discharge your battery when you use that electricity, a fuel cell makes electricity on demand. So when you provide it with fuel, hydrogen in this case, and oxygen from the air, you make electricity. And so this particular concept sort of lay on the shelf for uh, about 100 years, 130 years, until the 60s when NASA, looking for a power source for the space program and also looking for uh, drinkable water, potable water on uh, flight missions, decided to look at the fuel cell as a source of electricity. And that happened in the early 60s. And that was the first commercial application of this particular technology. Now, just to give you a reference uh, point, the internal combustion engine is 110 years old. And the battery is about 140 years old. So this is older than the battery in the internal combustion engine. Now, why is the fuel cell important? Why, is it, why, is it the peop why are people looking at it? From the previous speakers, you heard about global warming. You've heard about the declining or the degrading quality of the environment and particularly air quality. And in about 19, uh, actually in 1988, uh, the state of California, through the California Air Resources Board, decided that they were not going to continue to tolerate the declining quality of the air in the Los Angeles basin. They were counting, or they were measuring the quality of the air by the number of days they could see the mountains. And that those days, the number of those days were declining because of the, the occurrence of smog, uh, the increasing occurrence of smog. But they also found something else, that when they tested the lung capacity of an average uh, 10 or 11 year old uh, a, over a number of years, they saw it was declining. And in the previous 10 years, it had declined by 11%. Because these children are growing up in a declining quality of the air. So they came up with regulations that they're called zero emission vehicle regulations in those days because they felt, and they, it, was, it was confirmed, that 75% of the quality, uh, the declining quality of the air could be attributed to automobiles. And that was primarily, um, uh, you've heard the affectionate NOx and SOx but also unburnt hydrocarbon particulates that get into the lungs. And so they, were started, they started to say to the auto companies, you've got to come up with a better power source, a cleaner power source, uh, uh, and we're going to force you to do that. So the zero emission vehicle regulation said, we're giving you 15 years. In 2003, 10% of all new cars sold in California will be zero emission vehicles. And by the way, it doesn't mean you can give up 10% market share, because if you don't sell the 10%, we won't let you sell the other 90. 
That caused a huge explosion in new technologies, and the fuel cell, again, was then looked at. And the media had a big role to play. In 1988, when these regulations came out, the Los Angeles Times, the editor of the Los Angeles Times came to Vancouver to visit this little company uh, working in a garage, uh, and he came to see what we were doing, and he went back, and against a huge onslaught from the auto companies and the oil companies and, and utilities and everybody else who said this is impossible, it can't happen, uh, you can't regulate a solution, uh, this editorial was written in the Los Angeles Times, uh, which I think was a, a sort of a watershed uh, event in uh, the regulations being put into place. So today, 15 years later uh, or so, um, we now have a technology that has been developed over the last period of time that will provide the auto companies with a solution to create a zero emission vehicle. And this particular technology is going to enable something that you heard uh, Robert Hunter talk about earlier on, is that we as a society are not willing to change our lifestyle. We don't want to take a bus because we like the car. We like the convenience of a vehicle because it gives us mobility, it gives us convenience, it gives us the ability to do what we want to do when we want to do it in the way we want to do it. And so we as a society are not willing to change. Maybe over a few generations we might be. So what we are looking for and what the world is looking for is a solution that allows us to continue to do what we do. And in North America, that is to drive our automobiles. Which is why a fuel cell is very important because it is not only cleaner, but it's also more efficient as a, a, pro, uh, as a user of fuel in providing electrical power. And this is what's created all the interest. And so you will, I'm sure, would have read or heard about uh, demonstration buses in uh, Vancouver and Chicago and vehicles being demonstrated by a whole bunch of uh, automotive companies. But what is also occurring to people is that as you come up with new technology, you, ha you have, as you've heard of, uh, from Vaslav, a series of events that build on each other. And what has become apparent as you look at this technology, which is also being, uh, you know, it's been called a a number of things, but one of it is an enabling technology because it is now enabling the world to look at providing electricity to a large percentage of the world that doesn't have electricity today, the developing world, and doing it in a way that does, that does not require them to build the grid, the high voltage transmission lines. And there's a very good analogy, if you think about uh, telephony, there's a whole part of the world that is completely bypassed wires that have gone to cellular telephony as their primary telecommunication system. So fuel cells, because of the, the modularity, the cleanliness, if you like, and the, uh, the way it makes, the distributed manner in which it makes electricity will enable a whole part of the world whose, whose the, the quality of life uh, is dependent on the availability of electrical power, and they don't have electrical power today, is going to be able to use electricity. So you don't have to dam big rivers like the Three Gorges Dam or any other uh, type of big power sources such as uh, nuclear power. And these are small devices that can be put in villages and homes and so on that will allow the world to look at electricity in a way that has not been possible until today. So it started with cars, it started in space, started and then moved to cars, but it's also got applications elsewhere. So you will hear a lot about it, and there are a number of challenges, while it, it offers great promise, that we have to deal with. And these are challenges that we, as a society, are going to have to help a new technology like this overcome in order to establish itself. And what are those challenges? The first one is the challenge of an appropriate fuel. What is the fuel? Where do you get the fuel that's rich in hydrogen? How about hydrogen itself as a fuel? Uh, what other fuels are there that are rich in hydrogen? Methanol, ethanol, uh, gasoline itself, uh, although not a very clean way of extracting hydrogen, is possible. So what is the, f the fuel infrastructure that we're prepared to accept? The other one is what, how much more are we prepared to pay? Because these are new technologies, and in the early days of introduction, uh, they will be more expensive uh, than, the, than technologies we are uh, familiar with today or accustomed to paying today. So would you pay 
another $5,000 on your car, would you pay $10,000? That's a question you're going to have to ask yourself. And thirdly, uh, the challenge is how do we get a consistent set of rules and standards and certification and so on? And that's uh, a challenge for a small company like uh, ours and there are others where you not only have different rules in Canada versus the US versus Germany versus Japan, but even within states or within provinces you have different regulations and so on, which we have to decide whether we're going to harmonize these in a way that makes uh, it possible for new technology to come in. Well, there's another set of challenges that uh, I think people are just beginning to think about. In addition to being an enabling technology, the fuel cell is also a disruptive technology. Now, disruptive technology, for those of you who've read the uh, book by Christensen, talks about a dramatic change to the status quo. A and it happens very rapidly. And the internet is a good example of what it's done to the retailing business. And other industries will have yet, you know, we will see how they're going to be affected. But the fuel cell, as it comes into being, is going to have a dramatic impact on a number of industries. The steel industry is going to be a big one, because an engine from a fuel cell doesn't need any metal. It uses carbon and other, uh, other materials. So there's going to be a whole new set of industries that are going to be created from that. What about skill sets? You need more chemical engineers and chemists rather than mechanical engineers, which is what today's technology uses. What about uh, education? There is not a single uh, program today in anywhere in the, uh, in the world that teaches fuel cell engineering or fuel cells as, as a subject. And there are some that are just beginning to come about. And it is one of those few areas where industry is ahead of university or academic research, which is not the way it should be. Uh, but that's the way it is. And so there's a whole set of, of events that have to take place in terms of education and teaching people mechanics and, and technicians and so on about servicing these two, two types of technologies. Very disruptive to the skill set that we have today. The dislocation of people, unemployment, and all of those things that, that people think about. And finally, it is a technology that is going to help us uh, become much more in tune with the technologies that are coming into being. So it, it's, a, it's a convergence of a number of technologies. And I'm going to give you this example um, uh, before I stop. If you think the automobile today that we have, and when people started looking at fuel cells saying we need to make the engine cleaner, and there are lots of good, a lot of good work going on in a number of auto companies that's looking to make the internal combustion engine cleaner. There's also hybrid vehicles, which is a battery internal combustion engine combination. But as we start to look at an engine made from fuel cells, all of a sudden, other things started to open up. I'll give you some specific examples of what the car of the future might look like. And uh, this is my view. You don't have to agree with it. And uh, you can make up your own mind. Today's internal combustion engine battery alternator combination cannot produce enough electrical power for the things that we are demanding in our vehicles. So in addition to the electric seats and electric windows uh, that we are all used to, we're also looking for uh, computers and navigation systems uh, in our vehicles. The auto companies cannot provide that today. At the last Frankfurt Auto Show, there were uh, a Mercedes and a BMW with an auxiliary power unit, happened to be a fuel cell unit, to, make, to provide an extra electrical power just to provide it for the communication systems and so on. So if you were at the Detroit Auto Show in January, you would have seen two very important developments that are taking place that you will see in cars soon. First one is the internet dashboard. Ford had shown this particular dashboard. And uh, including in the, in the floor panel uh, was a 32-inch screen that popped up from the floor of the car. Um, and it was completely wired for communications, and you could access any part of the internet, just not information about anything you need. And so that is something we're going to see. The other thing we're going to see is, because we are spending more and more time in, in, in our cars, the commutes are getting longer, the traffic jams are getting worse, that we are demanding more things that we can do productively in the vehicle, communications, computers, entertainment, and so on. And finally, because we have more cars on the road, and it's getting more dangerous, and they're getting bigger, uh, whether you believe the physics or not. We 
need and and certainly annoying how my, my daughter drives, my 19-year-old, that I think the skill of the driver is getting worse. Uh, you're see, going to see the uh, drive-by-wire, like we see fly-by-wire today. Your car will be operated by software. The steering wheel that you turn will not really be connected to the axle. It's going to be connected through software. In order to do that, you need electric braking systems, electric steering systems, and so on. So if you're going to see all of this in a car, a car needs more electrical power. The internal combustion engine won't be able to meet this demand. The fuel cell makes electricity, and it makes lots of electricity. So to enable the next generation car, you will need a fuel cell. And that is why, economically, and because people are prepared to pay for those benefits, a fuel cell engine will come into a vehicle, not, because, not just because it is clean. Because, unfortunately, we've found that just because it's environmentally clean doesn't mean people are prepared to pay a premium for it. There might be a small premium, but not the sort of premium that's required. But if you give them, and think about an $85,000 navigator, compare that to an F-150 Ford $20,000 truck, what's the difference? The, the, it's the same platform. A $60,000 difference that we are prepared to pay for something else. And it's that something else that we have to provide to the world that will enable us to bring new technologies like the fuel cells, which will help us with the environmental challenge we have and the global warming uh, challenge that we've talked about. Thank you.